Action on Worker in Business in this year's Engagement Impact Festival. Uh, my name is Colin Rigby and I'll be chairing and introducing the session today. Uh, but before I introduce our guests who are going to be giving us a few words, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the festival and also some of my thoughts on working with business. Uh, so this is the largest festival we've had so far with nine separate sessions ranging from work with business clarity, research development, opportunity for policy, collaborating and so forth. And of course, we're all working towards this next phase of the knowledge exchange framework. The festival has uh, three aims, is to share and celebrate the achievements of some of the key academics and provide an, an environment whereby we can reflect and do as we were talking earlier about this peer-to-peer -peer, uh, learning, as we're all really busily beaver away in our own local patches. Uh, it gives us a chance to have a chat about it. It also provides an opportunity for Kiel's academic community to benefit from some external expertise. And I think that we've got some really excellent expertise today, including, including Nick. But also to engage colleagues on Kiel's institutional developments. Yeah, as, a, as a sector, we really do love to uh, measure ourselves, don't we, in terms of the, the TEF and the REF, and now we've got the CAF. And it gives us a chance to have a look at, have a look at some of those things. Okay, so if you haven't already, please have a look at some of those other sessions. Now, about the session today, it's not often that I get asked to uh, talk about something that I actually really care about, uh, a topic where we can create situations where everybody involved in them can really win, and a topic that provides both challenge and reward in equal measure. Well, that is essentially a description of, of my findings of working with business. Uh, this summer, I will complete my 350th in curricular student consulting live project. And I've also will complete my 125th CRIS project. And all of these projects are based around innovation and real life dilemmas or problem solving. But what it's also provided me with is an incredible network of organizations, both commercial, non-commercial, large and small. And that's allowed me to liberate me from textbook case studies in favor of having practice in the classroom and my classroom out in practice. Yeah. It's also has enriched my own research with everything from access to, to really high value live follow on projects. Now, when it comes to working with business, I really couldn't prescribe a one size fits all approach, but some things that characterize these interactions might be around uh, a few of the following. Yeah? I reject the idea of this false dichotomy between traditional missions of a university and what we often characterize as enterprise. As far as I'm concerned, it's all knowledge exchange. I think we can also, uh, when it comes to Keel's version of interacting with business, we have a focus on innovation and systematic creativity. Yeah? The renegotiation of our relationship with theory as something with the currency in the world of practice has been a real eye opener and something that I find, I have great uh, pleasure in passing on to the students. Yeah? We're also building an enormous network of organisations. But, and I think this is the one that, that really started me on the road of working with business, it is a manifestation of the civic university in practice, of us taking our place in the local, national and even international now, uh, framework of knowledge supply. Yeah. Now, they're just a few of the the things that I want to, to say, but one of the more flippant things I wanted to say was of those people who are thinking about doing this and they've got a few nerves about working with business, you've got to remember that they are just as frightened as us as we are of them. And that actually is a real barrier sometimes. Yeah. Okay. So I this is that today's uh, session is going to be quite interactive and I'm really delighted to welcome uh, to uh, people who I've worked with very closely and have been hugely helpful in my own practice. Yeah, and the first is uh, Nick Gostek, he's a director of the SIH. He has an extensive history with successful business startups. He's currently head of the Science and Innovation Park, but more importantly for me, is this, he's director of the Smart Innovation Hub, which I think Nick will say a few words about, but is, to my mind, quite unique in the world of HE in terms of its ambition and its scale but also to Phil Chapman. Uh, Phil is a uh, research innovation advisor. And for any of you who are interested in doing practice facing work and stretching your innovation muscles, yeah, the research and innovation advisors are really super good to get in touch with. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Phil 
to uh, say a few words. Phil. Thank you very much. Colin, hi everybody and great to be here. Um, uh, I'm going to start with a little bit of a, a general outline about what the session is going to cover. So um, Colin and I will start with maybe 20 minutes or so of um, how we do work with business generally. And um, and then we'll pass over to Nick for a session, a longer session on commercialisation. There'll be an opportunity for discussion through both of those. I'm very happy to take questions and comments along the way. Um, we're going to focus, Colin and I, on three things in particular. First of all, how do we do biz work with business at Keele? Um, and we'll hear directly from some of our academics about that uh, by way of a little video that we recorded a couple of years ago. So why are they involved? What, what's in it for them? And what do they, why do they do it? Um, then we'll move on to what the benefits are, both for the university and for the companies, and what the overlaps are between those two uh, potentially quite different views. And uh, and then we'll look at some of the sources of funding that are available to people who do want to engage in working with business, because there's actually a lot out there, but it's knowing where to go for it and how to um, capitalise on it. Um, the video is about five minutes long, and um, even though it was recorded a couple of years ago, it talks directly to some of the academics who've done these these projects, including Colin. I can't claim to be anything like as as um, uh, expert and and have covered as many projects as Colin has, but um, I've certainly got lots under my belt so far, including different roles in different institutions prior to this. Um, and, and I think it's really interesting to hear from them what they see as, uh, as the, the state of play. Feel free, apart from through the video, to just interrupt with by putting a virtual hand up or a real hand or, um, or, or just putting some comments on the chat. So I will share my screen now and hopefully... Uh, and include computer sound. OK. Right, can everybody see that? Yes. Um, should start slideshow. There we go. OK. So first and foremost, um, how do we do it at the moment at Keel? And I, I may have missed things off here, but to my knowledge, the, these are the kind of things that we do. CRISP, the, the Keel Research and Innovation Support Programme, which is the programme that I'm most closely aligned to, although I do get involved in other things as well, um, which has been running now for four years and allows us to do short innovation, research innovation projects with local companies funded by the EU. Um, the next three are all also funded by the EU and were set up as part of the new Keel deal as a kind of bunch of products. Um, that Keel got funding for through the ERDF. The first one is MSIL, which is the Mercia Centre for Innovation Leadership, which is a leadership development programme. Next one is SEND, Smart Energy Network Demonstrator. And the final one is Business Bridge, which is a healthcare related innovation programme. Um, then there's the Smart Innovation Hub. There's a little bit of overlap here because actually now CRISP and MSIL also fall within the Smart Innovation Hub uh, offer. Um, and Nick can tell you more about incubation, but basically we've got businesses um, uh, who are resident in IC6 and who have a package of support available to them, including CRISP and MSIL, but other things like um, business boot camps and one-to-one uh, -one support and so on, networking opportunities, events. Uh, there's in-curriculum activity where, um, I, and some of you I'm sure are very aware of this, that within, within courses um, students can go and do project work, um, go out for a year in industry, etc. <coughs> Knowledge transfer partnerships, we're beginning to get much more into as a university and um, Colin in particular has been doing great guns on knowledge transfer partnerships recently with my colleague Emma Bonfilio and the business school 
Um, and I'll talk a bit more about knowledge transfer partnerships a bit later under funding streams. Um, they come from UK government under UKRI, which is the UK Research and Innovation Unit. PhDs um, can be a great way to, to work with businesses. And then we have advisory groups, a couple of advisory groups that um, one that Colin's involved in through the business school, but also one that I'm involved in through my um, primary school, which is School of Computing and Maths, where we bring in academic, uh, sorry, academics, but also representatives from business to um, to give us a kind of critical friend eye on how to do business uh, within the university and how to make sure that we're we're um, getting graduates that are ready for work within the companies that we're we're working with. OK, so they're the main main ways in which we currently collaborate with with businesses and companies. I'm going to start the video now and um, somebody hopefully will let me know if this doesn't start playing as I move on to the next um, screen or if you can't hear it when it does. <laughs> The best thing about supervising CRISP is twofold. It's seeing companies bloom, be innovative, work with new ideas, and similarly, students grow into full members of their own economic community. So for, for me, CRISP uh, was an opportunity to work with industry, which uh, is not uh, normally what I do as, as an astrophysicist. What CRISP means to me is uh, uh, a really innovative way to bring uh, students together with local businesses. So what Keel Management School have done is they've embraced CRISP by uh, bringing it into the curriculum. This kind of um, endeavour to help small and medium-sized businesses I think is desperately needed and I'm, I'm glad to be part of it. The students get to work with a company on a project and what I find this is really good is that these projects can be linked to their teaching and research areas. So the project that I've supervised um, was uh, to work with a, uh, a company who uh, does uh, quite, quite technical work uh, on a radio uh, observatory and as a radio astronomer I find that quite interesting and they also use uh, masers which we can also observe in the universe so for me that brought a link between the research I do and the application in industry. One of the projects that I supervised um, was for a, a business that was that got some really innovative ideas about um, revolutionising um, the way conveyancing works in, uh, in the UK. The first one, let's stick to them in turn, Shrim Hair, was a startup company with a crazy idea, kind of Uber for haircuts. Um, and I didn't, I didn't think it had a chance. Um, but the students went into it with tremendous enthusiasm. The two um, entrepreneurs, shall we call them, were also tremendously enthusiastic. And they managed to put it all together. I think the greatest thing about supervising this project is uh, to see one of our students uh, take on something really challenging and different and grow through the project and do really well in the end. I was quite proud of her. Um, I guess what was good about the project was seeing students in a new light. That access to real, um, real applied knowledge. So the students are going in there often working on strategic projects with these companies with access to information that's not in a textbook, and it's not in research papers, it's out there being applied. So the anecdotal richness that it gives my teaching is, is um, just invaluable. You've got to see Chris as the beginning of a journey. And in that journey, what you're doing is you're making the connection with the organisation and you're demonstrating that the university is both useful and trustworthy. And that can lead to all sorts of uh, fantastic outcomes. If we take Wood Mitchell, for example, we did a number of CRISP projects there, and that has led on to a KTP, which has led on to business development, which has led on to innovation, and has led on to, as it stands, uh, three conference papers and one journal paper in their publication. And that is a great set of outcomes for what is an enjoyable process anyway. One of the unexpected benefits of working on CRISP projects has been the opportunity to forge really good links with local businesses uh, in ways that I didn't expect. Um, one of the most recent projects that I've been working on actually uh, has now turned into a, a developing KTP with quite a high value um, and, and, and very interesting. It looks like we're going to be 
be able to produce some uh, quite novel technology. The, the process of setting these things up is really easy. There's a whole team in place and, you know, I know everybody's got their own area that they work in, but the, the team all work together, so I found the team to be really supportive. Uh, the process is really easy. You get a lot of support. Um, all you need to do is work with the students and advise. Um, basically, the students are doing most of the work. With Chris, it's been amazing. Um, aside from four or five meetings with the company per project and then supporting the students directly, um, there's been no additional work, no paperwork. That's all taken care of by the amazingly efficient Chris team. I think it's a fantastic opportunity to get um, some some really truly unique experiences, um, not just of uh, of working outside the university, but working in um, you know exciting startup ventures uh, which are agile and move fast and require people to think on their feet and uh, and all of these things that you get in those kind of environments, which you may not get if you went to uh, to work in a, in a normal business. I would very much recommend doing a Chris project to students. If you want to use all of that knowledge that you've gathered during your time at university and put it to work and make that connection between your academic learning and your career, then it's a perfect opportunity to do exactly that. Okay, so um, brilliant way of just articulating, I think, what what the benefits are of of um, working with business both from an academic perspective but also on behalf of the students who engage with the the um, companies um, and just in case people didn't pick out the the real gems from from among all of that text um, here are some of them just to to recap so seeing crisp as the start of a journey making connections demonstrating that the university is useful and trustworthy um, needs agility and fast thinking, um, things that you wouldn't get elsewhere, enjoyable and, and great outcomes. The, the journey through all of the different things and the development from CRISP into innovation conference papers, journal papers and the like, um, and then linking teaching and research and, and the applied nature of these projects. So, um, so really would encourage anybody and everybody, of course, to get involved with this kind of work. Um, we see huge benefits locally, economically, and within the university from doing so. Um, so things to note. So, of course, as, as Colin said, the starting point is that actually we're a bit nervous of each other. Um, and we've discovered this through a variety of, of interactions and things like the latest advisory group meeting we had with computing maths where um, the, the companies some of these chief execs of big local companies you know who's saying actually we're a bit terrified of coming into the university because we we just feel a bit stupid you know we don't think we can hold our own amongst all these academics and then the academics holding their hands up and saying no but we're actually in awe of you as companies and and we're we're equally scared to come in and and think that we don't have relevant knowledge or we can't make it make it connect across the two the two fields um so so i think one of the things that's important is to kind of work out how how that works for both sides what what is the business going to get out of it you have to be thinking about what's what's the picture for the business as well as what's the picture for the university um, and and what are the objectives of the two one against the other what are the likely expectations of the company um, because they they're used to moving at a very different pace from the way the university sometimes works and they will also expect things like real high levels of professionalism timeliness delivery um, meeting, you know, where, where are you going to meet? Where do, do they want us to come to their business or do they want to come to the university? All things that need to be taken into consideration. And then this kind of client company relationship. Um, so being aware of that and sensitive to it is, is really important. Um, and I think that some of the, the ways to make it work, this is by no means neither of these or um, a, a full comprehensive list, you know, you could add all sorts of other things to it. But but 
some of the ways to make it work, I think, are these kind of things about listening, really listening to what the business is saying. What do they need? What do they want? What are they looking for? What are they hoping for? What are their challenges? Um, so be curious, ask questions. There's, there's lots of time at the front end of a, of a CRISP project goes into that early stage of, of really getting to grips with what the project actually is um, and making sure that we can meet the, the expectations that we have, the expertise that's required by the company overcome that fear they're just people like we are and, and once you get to that level and you've started being curious and asking questions the fear kind of goes away um, think about the locations thing visit the business go and have a look at what's what's going on for them and encourage them to come in to to us those who were in the session on friday um, theo theo said that you know he he went to the business first of all and uh, and they had various conversations about it and he saw for himself what what the questions were uh, at Bentley and what the challenges were, even though he didn't think that he had a place in solving them. And then he invited them to come and visit him in his office in computing and maths here. Don't try to be the expert. They're the expert in their business. So work with them on an expert to expert version uh, version of things by all means. But but, you know, we don't have all the answers. It's about cooperation and collaboration and working with them to understand where the where the um, the answers might be and where some of the solutions that we might come up with can come from. Uh, recognize the, the student development side of things that, you know, empowering students to take take responsibility and work with some of these things with a lot of academic support is a really helpful thing and actually can also bring new new insights and new ideas because they they've grown up in a whole environment that we haven't um, and foster trusting and authentic relationships so it's all about that and and the the relationship building along the way and we always see those early little crisp projects as the first step in a, a longer and hopefully more lasting relationship um i'm talking too much <laughs> relative benefits um for the university include things like commercialization access to funding industry feedback hugely important and and helpful to us the potential for impact case studies graduate opportunities, commercial awareness, real world contact um, and the company benefits from bright young minds, access to academic support and input, sometimes academic uh, access to equipment and training, our graduates, especially where we've managed to match exactly what they want from them, um, profile raising uh, by the liaison with us and an evidence base for some of the things they're doing. And again, I've put other on both of those lists because there are lots of other things that I'm sure between us we could all add on to those, those lists of benefits. Where they overlap, um, I think are around things like knowledge sharing, peer networking, journal publications, again, impact case studies and commercialization, access to funding, which for a lot of those funding pots are only open to HEIs working in collaboration with businesses um, and then graduate opportunities and profile raising again. So lots of benefits individually but also lots of shared benefits and therefore reasons for doing as much of this as we, we can. Um, and then I've, I've really focused only on UKRI, uh, the, the research and innovation um, unit funded primarily by by government but matched in some cases by public um, money and these are some of the um, latest funds that are um, being advertised on UKRI's um, website at the moment so some of them have changed a little bit a lot of them are exactly the same as they were before Brexit um, Horizon 2020 is still live and uh, there's a new Horizon Europe fund of 95 billion, which will run until 2027. 20, the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund is still, still around with clean growth, ageing society, future of mobility and AI and data economy. Again, another 5.6 billion. 
1.5 billion for global challenges um, for, for developing countries, strategic priorities fund, uh, another 800, you know, the, the sums are huge. Um, and if you can find the links and the and the match and and be sure that you've got the right fund and the right um, the right kind of project idea, the the success levels are quite high for some of these things. Strength in places fund. Um, there've been two waves of funding so far. I don't think there are any that are currently live, but these things come and go. So it's a case of looking at when the next um, tranche of funding will become available. Um, and then things like future leaders fellow, fellowships, the Fund for International Collaboration, Newton Fund, Infrastructure Fund Open Research. All of the research councils work with um, UKRI and um, you're probably quite familiar with how that, how that works. Innovate UK is like a separate um, section of UKRI and is all about introduction of new products, services and processes. So very much like um, our CRISP project, but on a much, much bigger scale, um, has its own grant pots for knowledge transfer partnerships, catapults, COVID support, smart grants and so on. Um, and then works with the other UKRI funds and, and councils. Um, and that's a real whiz through um, some of the ways in which we work with businesses. Um, so I don't know if there are any comments or questions, um, but I'll stop sharing my screen and um, uh, questions, comments. No, in which case it gives me very great pleasure to uh, hand over to Nick. Thank you very much, Colin. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I've got some slides to uh, sort of give a bit of structure to what uh, what we're going to talk about, but please feel free to interject, interrupt, ask questions. Um, you know, it's a little bit difficult to judge where people are in terms of where their knowledge is, and I've I've assumed sort of a a, 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 a sort of a base level of knowledge, so. A lot of the presentation that I've I've got today has sort of been aimed at early career researchers in the past, but some of you might want to to jump in and 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 um, move the discussion up a gear or two if if the stuff I'm talking about you're you're already very familiar with. So um, I'll just start um, with. Uh, hang on a second. No, that, I'm just going to have to do that again. Uh, there we go. That's what I'm after. And if I now start the presentation. Right, has that come up OK? Good, fantastic. So I thought I'd start with a nice picture of um, the Denny's Coates Foundation building, or as a lot of us call it, the Smart Innovation Hub. Um, it, it's a complicated building because it is three buildings in one and it is home to Kiel, Kiel University Business School. Um, it's home to the Smart Innovation Hub project, which is a project I lead, which includes CRISP and MSIL and support for early stage businesses. And it's also home to IC6, Innovation 6, which is part of the Science Park. Um, so we have about 20 small innovative companies based in the building and the concept behind the building was to bring those three groups of people together, hopefully in the large atrium space, lubricated with our excellent coffee and see what sparks fly, interaction happens, collaboration comes out of it. Um, and we've got more formal meeting spaces, lecture theatres, boardrooms um, and small meeting rooms as, as well. And it was just starting to all come together and happen when we went on to, into lockdown. And now for the last 18 months, we've just been looking at pictures of our nice building. Um, I have been there, there a couple of times and, and actually a lot of our tenants have um, carried on working all the way through. 
um, as has the wider science park, which is fortunate as uh, as I'm sure you're all aware, Cobra are, are, are making the AZ vaccine on site, um, which will help us get us get us through this. Um, it's not just the people in the building. It's also a hub for activities as well. And when we're back in the space, um, we hope that other companies from the science park will start to adopt the space as their breakout and informal areas and colleagues from across the university not just the business school will come and grab a coffee and and, and see it as a place to interact with business and to become something of a of a neutral territory that hopefully is is familiar to business people in 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 terms of the design and the feel and the and the way the space works but also familiar to university colleagues in that it's um, got students milling about and it's and it's very much part of the university. So that's the the um, smart innovation hub. Um, a little bit about myself, um, as my my uh, colleagues keep reminding me, I've, I've had a long and 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 um, long career as a bit of a dilettante so I've jumped around and had a little go at all sorts of things so they're often amazed when when something comes up in a conversation and oh I did a bit of that a few a few years ago um but of relevance I did a PhD in biotechnology oh long long time ago in the, the mid 80s um and I set my first company up in 1992 at the age of 29 and that was called Scientific Solutions Limited um and it was very much a an innovation based business, but working in in the area of of environmental biotechnology and specifically um, industrial wastewater treatment and contaminated land remediation, which back then wasn't really very sexy. But of course, with increasing role for climate change is suddenly a very interesting area. Um, but I certainly found it interesting at the time. Although I did eventually sell the business and join the University of Sheffield um, to get involved in what for then was quite a new activity, and that's university technology transfer. Uh, I had a lot of fun in, in seven years at Sheffield and set up a number of businesses, uh, some of which crashed and burned and failed miserably, some of which eh, sort of were OK, and some of which were quite successful. And actually looking back, several of those businesses have now sold for multi-million pound sums and uh, I'm pleased to say that some of the people I worked with in those days made quite a bit of money. Not me sadly, I'm still working but um, hey ho. Um, I, after seven years at Sheffield, I then joined University, uh, well BioCity in Nottingham which was um, a, a bioincubator Again, another new initiative, and we built that into one of the largest bio incubators in Europe on multiple sites. Um, I then did the same again, but in clean tech, but on a little bit of a smaller scale. And this time, rather than being funded by universities and uh, and, and DRDF grants, we were funded with um, private money with a, a business partner who was a serial entrepreneur who'd set up um, over 30 businesses and some have been quite successful. Um, and then I took the rash decision of rejoining the university system and I spent some years at Warwick Ventures, spinning out companies, Birmingham Enterprise before pitching up at Keele a couple of years ago. So, um, <clears throat> what I wanted to talk about today was um, what's usually called university technology transfer and I see this as, as the sort of sharp end of the in innovation spear um but it, it, it I, it's still an important part of of um of innovation and an important part in which part in which universities can contribute to knowledge exchange through assisting technology invented within the university and the science and, and discovery from the university sector to make it into the real world and in this case we're looking at those technologies which really need the mechanism of the market to to become established and to be widely used and 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 to create the impact that we're, we're keen to to generate um i've sort of split it into a three-step process um i played around with the idea of three v's but i had to use a little bit of uh, artistic license 
Uh, and then I noticed there was a fourth of the, which I'd forgotten about. But the three processes are invention, validation and valorization. And for those of you unfamiliar with valorization, it's used more frequently by uh, colleagues in the US to describe technology transfer as we tend to use the terms exploitation and commercialization. And I think both those terms come with rather too much baggage. So valorization is actually creating value and and um, realizing the value from knowledge and, 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 and from knowledge that's being created within the university. Um, the fourth thing was in innovation, um, which I suppose I could have added in there. Um, and I, I put in the, the sort of usual term that it starts with a good idea. Um, but actually, that's not where I'm going to start. I'm actually going to go a little bit before the good idea and talk about where invention comes from. And um, looking at Kiel policy in this area, and if you want to check, there's a there's a, a Kiel has a, a policy on on um, commercialization and, and, and developing um, uh, business from from commercial uh, activities at the university. Um, and and the policy is that that we create the right environment for excellent research and, and there's an extension of that from for excellent exchange of, of knowledge into the into the community. And I, and I and I think the first point to make about invention is that um, it requires a little bit of mental dexterity to move away from the curiosity um, and very much um, goal focused work of of research of of publications of getting grants and actually um, to be a little bit more like an entrepreneur um, to increase the opportunities of impact from research. And what do I mean by I think a little bit more like an entrepreneur and actually I think that comes down to rather than starting with a good idea, entrepreneurs like to start with a really good problem because um, ideas, you know, sometimes they're dime a dozen. It's it's or ten a penny. Um, it's it's actually the execution of of that idea and the matching of that idea to solve a problem that somebody really cares about. So I'd call that entrepreneurial problem solving. Um, and this is an area. And if you if you type effectual reasoning or effectual entrepreneurship into into Google, there's a lot of stuff on the internet which was really sort of started by um, Sarah Saravathi, a, a business professor at, and I can't remember which university she's at, but at US at university, who did some work and looked at how entrepreneurs solve problems. And they tend to solve problems by um, very practical means, by using what they have um, in their vicinity at their immediate disposal. So it's a, it's a very um very practical way of 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 addressing problems and solving solving problems um which isn't exclusively the preserve of entrepreneurs and in fact entrepreneurs show other sorts of thinking as well but it's very much understanding what assets i have available and what i can do with them um so it's a it, it's an interesting piece of work and some of those some of the the next couple of slides sort of fall out from that 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 work and those reflections. She's done a um, she's written a couple of books which are, which are quite interesting as well. Um, and and I think um, the other thing I'll come back to is um, a process of customer discovery. And I think how do you know that you've got a good problem? You've got to go to the person or the people or the industry that owns that problem. So that's very much a case of um, uh, and, and that's very much a case of um, uh, actually going out and talking to industry. So the iCure process I'll come back to. It's an Innovate UK um, program which is which continues to run and has been been very popular. And that starts with the idea of actually uh, giving early career researchers the opportunity to get out into the world and go and talk to a minimum of 100 potential customers for their technology and not try and sell their technology, but just talk to them about their, pro their problems, their industry 
and what makes a difference difference to them and then come back and reevaluate what the opportunity that they have really is. Um, I'm just going to pause shortly because I can see some questions coming in, which I can't see on my main screen. I'm going to bring you a. Uh, yeah. So I'm fielding the questions while you talk, don't worry. <laughs> OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that point of defining the, the, the problem is 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 really important. And, and actually, um, I didn't put the slide in, but um, there's quite a few studies that have looked at why businesses fail. And time and time again, the reason they fail is because they've got a product that nobody actually wants or nobody actually wants to pay for. And, and you know, most entrepreneurs embark on the process of entrepreneurship um, relying on the on a on a um you know on a sample size of one themselves as to whether their product would be any good so um so i think i'll come back to customer discovery in, in the next section but i think that's quite an interesting area and and, and one of the reasons that the iq program has been particularly successful so starting with a really good problem and then increasing the chances of finding that problem and actually solving a problem uh you know come back to um the individual and, and the individual entrepreneur or in or in this case the individual academic and it's a combination of what you know and a lot of that is know-how technology possibly sector knowledge and, and and of course your area of research expertise but also important is who you know and and this comes back to networking and 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 most business people understand the importance and power of networking of actually who you know who you can talk to who who has a solution for you for your problem and also important is who you are and i think finding a selection uh, finding a solution to a problem that works with a way you're comfortable is really important and in in the academic environment that means if you are keen to be an entrepreneur to set up a spin out company to jump in wholeheartedly into commercialization that's fine but you need to work out how that fits with your career aspirations how that fits with how you like to work and your capacity and and, and appetite for risk and there are solutions that perhaps don't require such a level of commitment but still still work so understanding who you are in this context is really important i was quite surprised when i i called back uh, some entrepreneurs that i'd been working with at Bio city um a year later and we worked through the question why haven't you been as successful as you would have would like to have been which didn't mean that they hadn't been successful but but all of them felt they could have been more successful if if you know if they if everything had gone their way and time and time again, the issues which prevented them from being as successful as they wanted to be were actually personal rather than business issues. It was about confidence. It was about support of family, it, dealing with issues like illness, um, keeping motivation when you're when you're working on, on your own, rather than, as I'd expected, business issues like access to finance and uh, intellectual property protection. So understanding who you are is is really important part of this process of of um solving problems in a way that 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 leads to to impact so a little bit more coming back to to what you know and thinking like an, an entrepreneur about um your own research area your own knowledge your own, own technology and research <laughs> and time and time again, when I see an opportunity emerging from a from a, a university, the ones that are successful are able to have some sort of leverage. And and by that, I mean something that gives them a uniqueness, an angle, a, a um, something that people will pay for. And too often you see people that have a me too product which is exactly the same that, as everything that's already established in the marketplace and that's going to be really tough to commercialize um, because to be successful you need to have some sort of leverage or some ang angle 
So when you think about your technology or your 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 research area, the things that are interesting is where it's faster or stronger or lighter or it's cheaper to make or it's smaller than what than what's existing in the marketplace. Uh, and, and of course, there's other things like, is it more sustainable? Is it natural? Um, is it utilising recycled materials or is it utilising more robust materials that last longer? Um, it's it's there's an, an envelope which all all technologies exist in, but the bits that become commercially interesting is is the parts of that envelope which are unique. So you might have something that that works very much like an existing technology in the marketplace, but your technology also works at higher temperatures and suddenly that becomes interesting. But the other key point of, of leverage is actually it's targeting at those areas where it has unique characteristics rather than trying to get into the large market where any benefit is small or or any advantage of the project product is is quite um is is not substantive so that concept of leverage is is really important and sometimes it's not the most scientifically interesting thing about your technology that is where the commercial opportunity comes from that that you know i i'm um, i've been a, a, a innovate uk bid assessor and time and again i've i've had bids that come to me that scientifically are very important cutting edge public published in in leading journals but the business not so interesting Whereas sometimes you can have a relatively small or, or, or um, you know, not so, so cutting edge from a scientific point of view, but the business opportunity is substantive. So the two are not necessarily linked. And I've got a, an example here. I'll just just quickly talk you through. And that's a company which was a spin out from Warwick University, a company called Medherent. Um, and the, the product that they've, they've developed is transdermal drug delivery so it's a patch with they started with ibuprofen but actually they've they've gone on to develop a number of other um, therapeutics which they can deliver from from um, from a patch and unusually for a university spin out this started with the problem um, one of my colleagues at uh, at Warwick um, oh I've just managed to put something down on my keyboard and shot ahead. There we go. Um, so, uh, yeah, one of my colleagues at Warwick was actually talking to some businesses and he discovered that there was a significant problem with the amount of drug that could be delivered via a transdermal patch. And one of the problems was that you also need to have the adhesive, that the adhesive and the drug are often incompatible, or the adhesive forms a, la a layer that the drug has to, a further layer that the drug has to, to permeate through. So, um, so he took the problem into the university with one of the university's chemistry professors, Professor Halton, I think from memory, and and said, look, this is the problem, and the so and the solution was relatively straightforward from a from a technical point of view, but it was unique, um, it was patentable, and they very quickly found an industrial partner in 3M, and and from those relatively humble beginnings, the company was able to raise significant funding from um, Midlands Engine Innovation Fund uh, through Mercy Ventures, and um, I think they've now got certainly double figures of staff work there and 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 are uh, are doing medical uh, clinical trials to get the product through to the marketplace so starting with a good problem and really understanding that problem is 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 a really powerful place to start in terms of a, 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 a the application of of some science and technology so just to finish off this section on 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 invention who do you tell? And and um, the policy at the university is to report that to the Directorate of Research, Innovation and Enterprise. Um, our policy actually refers to the head of partnerships development. Um, 
but there isn't one at the moment. Um, there will be two, we've, but uh, the first one starts later this week and we're in the process of recruiting somebody else. So um, by all means, contact me um, if you want to, to uh, report that you've got something of interest. The first step is to fill in a disclosure form and the invention disclosure is really important because it captures who made that invention, what it is, um, who was involved and that the head of school or, or head of faculty has been consulted so that it so that it isn't somebody you know operating in isolation because there, there's often sensitivities around around using research and, and research findings. At this point, I would suggest that there's a need, need for confidentiality and it's always a tension in the university between telling people about your research and publications and the need for confidentiality. It can be dealt with, but it but it needs to be looked at to see if a patent is is required to protect a technology before taking it forward. I'll say more about patents um, in a bit. Um, the other thing to note about Kiel's policy is that it explicitly states that the university values impact more than profit and that actually the, the reason for commercialising um, a technology from the university is because it is the most effective way for that invention to generate impact, not because it will make a return. And also it's worth noting that commercialization isn't the only way to achieve knowledge exchange. There are other ways and there are other ways of commercializing that don't necessarily require a patent. But I'll say a bit more about that in a bit. Um, being Keel, of course, resources are very limited. We don't have a specific patent budget like some of our larger, um, some of the larger universities. Um, we don't now have a dedicated team. It, it is a, a mainstream activity that's supported by colleagues in um, partnerships development, um, but drawing in expertise from, for instance, my team. Uh, and of course, if you want to go down this road, you do have to co consider how this works in terms of your, your career. But increasingly, um, being able to demonstrate um, experience and expertise in uh, technology transfer is highly sought after by a number of universities, particularly the Russell Group universities, where this is a, a very important part of, of what they do and, and, and what they see themselves being important um, leaders of. So uh, next stage is validation. Uh, and whilst I've, I've been suggesting that thinking a little bit more like an entrepreneur um, will help to recognise good problems and find solutions to those problems. Um, in the last decade or so, entrepreneurs have, have been thinking more like scientists to improve the success of their businesses. Um, they've been adopting uh, something called the lean startup approach, which like many things has come from America. Um, for some time, I, I, I struggled against the, 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 the sort of the jargonish approach to it. Um, and, and I preferred the term evidence based entrepreneurship, but I think lean startup is now very much in the mainstream and, and taught by business schools and um, uh, and, and, and forms the you know, a big part of the IQ program, which I mentioned earlier, which is an Innovate UK program. Um, so lean start, where did it come from? I think you can see a line that started with lean manufacturing, which was developed in the 1990s by Toyota, which is very much based on waste minimization and the scientific method. Um, and similar ideas sort of went into um, agile software development um, with um, prioritizing individuals and interactions over process and tools. Uh, getting to a working software rather than uh, a finely finished product and very much collaborating with with customers. Um, 
so a, a, a quite an entrepreneurial approach to to development and I think putting those together and particularly with a focus on the scientific method um, is is where lean startup came came from um, so it started with um, some books uh, the, the two people who are generally credited with lean startup are um, Steve Blank and Eric Rees uh, from um, uh, California. I think they were both at um, possibly, I think it was Barclay or they ended up at Barclay, UC Barclay. Um, and uh, it was also part of the the business school training that they were that they were doing at the at the time. Um, the approach is one of um, taking a, a reductionist approach and, and trying to break down the assumptions that you make about the commercial opportunity in your product into smaller constituent parts, which then you can test individually. But of course, sometimes the best approach is just to get something in the in the market and test it with real customers, put it in the hands of customers. Um, and this is an approach called minimum viable product. Um, and, and it can be a good approach, but many times the cost of putting something in the market is prohibitively expensive until you've you validated and de-risked it enough. And certainly when we're talking about many university technologies, the road to getting into the marketplace is quite long and expensive. Um, so Lean Start Measure challenges us to find ways to test those assumptions. Um, and ideally as quickly and cheaply as possible. And, and another um, bit of jargon, fail fast, fail cheap. Um, I worked with um, some ladies in Nottingham as part of an accelerator programme who had the great idea that they wanted to develop a business around fast food, fast, healthy food for students. And we spent um, a very wet Wednesday lunchtime with clipboards talking to students to discover that students that liked healthy food generally were those that were quite well organised and had a packed lunch. And those that liked fast food because they had come unprepared were also those that would wanted chips. And that really there wasn't that much of a market for, for healthy fast food. Um, so um, they both decided that, that the business wouldn't survive the way it was and pivoted into other businesses. Um, so one lady actually started a um, an ethical cosmetics company, which has been very successful, and the other lady pivoted into um, a still with healthy food, but but um, an initiative which focused on alleviating poverty and working with some of their housing associations in 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 Nottingham. So both were then successful and didn't waste time, money and effort on a business which which wasn't going to work. Um, and that really comes to that, that uh, the final point of. If you are able to test your assumptions and you're able to falsify them and find that your assumptions are wrong, it's an opportunity to learn, not a failure and gives you the opportunity to pivot the business into an area where it's more successful. And in this case, pivoting means either You've you've found a customer group with a problem, but there is a better solution that you can you can base your business on or your solution is still valid. It's just you were targeting the wrong customers and by targeting the right customers, you can find a better business opportunity. And just as uh, uh, Phil has done, looking at some of the, the, the funding for technology commercialization. Um, most of the, the, the funding in this area would come under the, the con, under the titles of proof of concept or proof of market. Um, impact acceleration accounts not available at all universities. Um, MRC have funding in this area, but as Phil already mentioned, the big funder in 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 this sort of area between research and 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 commercialization in the market is Innovate UK. Um, and I've had su several successful bids to Innovate UK. Um, the money is usually quite good. The um, 
it's not usually as competitive as as a, as a lot of the other research competitions um but you do have to um position any bid for money to innovate uk in the right way they are very concerned that what they fund has a good chance of ending up in the marketplace and of having real impact over the years i think they feel they funded too much stuff which was interesting but didn't actually yield anything um impactful in the marketplace so successful bids into innovate uk have good evidence that there's a real problem that somebody will pay to solve that there's an unmet need and that might be an unmet clinical need that there is a a route to market um and and the best way to evidence a route, a route to market is have industry already involved in what you're doing because they probably are the best have the best market knowledge and if they're prepared to get involved and commit time or even better commit money then that's a tremendous validation that the problem is substantive enough that a solution will will form a form a, a, a good product um i'm just going to pause the breath there has anybody got any questions or interjections or comments they want to make or anything they want to go into more detail I'll just take this chance to have a look at some of the comments. Just to uh, start the discussion, in some sense, <clears throat> are, are the fundings more like a, for each step or do they? In, <clears throat> that's one question. The other one is if uh, if it's uh, good to fail fast and fail cheap, I mean, and it's hard to predict success, isn't it uh, expected from Innovate UK that most of what they fund will be a failure and mm. they should I mean, I was just one. I asked earlier, what is the success rate? But my expectation is to have 10% success rate. But the one in 10 businesses that that uh, takes off and is successful pays for the other nine. But I was wondering whether Innovate UK was also like thinking along those lines, because you you just have to f accept failure is part of the the game. Yeah, I I I think it very much depends what it is that you're that you're developing as an innovation and it is true that a lot of businesses fail and actually coming back to the point about the reason that lean startup sort of rests on lean was that it it was about waste minimization but in the case of early stage businesses it's about wasted effort and wasted resource so the point of failing fast and and, and failing cheap is it preserves the resources that you have available to further invest in a in a in a um in an opportunity that has a greater success because if you eliminate your 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 bad ideas then hopefully what's left will be richer in good ideas um so there's a, a, a so the, the concept you know you you see a sort of a um a a a, a pathway to finding that um that valuable and scalable uh, business solution, um, you know, and that and that path might you might go down some dead ends, but ultimately you you'll head in the right direction. And if you learn as you go along, you're building up that knowledge. Then each time your your likelihood of success is is somewhat increased. Um, and again, it depends what sort of business it is, because the one in ten comes from venture capital and venture capital funding where you where that business model requires very highly leveraged businesses they they need to have the opportunity of returning a substantial amount of money to the investors to cover the the, the bets that 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 don't come off so they're looking for return on their money of a, a five to ten fold increase in their investment over a five to seven year period there's a reason that, that their investments are time limited because a typical fund has a 10 year lifetime and um, and they need that level of return to to um, to cover the the cost of those businesses that are that are that are not successful and I and I think that that actually um, means that there will be potentially successful businesses which they walk away from because the 
chance of success that or, or success just doesn't yield enough return to cover their losses so for instance a consultancy based business a service based business um, might have a good chance of success a good chance of giving you the, the founders a good return but not but not enough return for vent for venture capital investment as a class of investment and sometimes those businesses can raise money further down the track where the risks are reduced and and therefore the return that the investors are looking for it's a different class of investment and they'll accept a lower return but because they're making a less risky investment well don't underestimate the difficulty of eliminating bad ideas <laughs> yeah yeah uh, or, or or sticking by good ideas um you know some of the some of the um I think the investors have a term that what is it uh, plums lemons ripen before plums or something like that so the the bad ones often turn bad earlier than the the good ones turn good and that and that some of these businesses can take years rather than than months to actually achieve achieve something there's a, there's the difficulty of when entrepreneurs come to the university to game advice they've often tested these ideas but they've tested it with people that they know and often people who are have huge amounts of affection for them so they come up with uh, anecdotal evidence base that this is a really good idea a world-changing idea and it's up to us as the sort of academic community to disrupt that all that orthodoxy that they've generated uh, by providing the means by which they can generate the evidence that will either support or disprove that particular idea. yeah uh, and, and I think that for some entrepreneurs, you know, they are quite emotionally attached to their ideas, which is very dangerous. And, and you know, you should never tell a parent that they've got an ugly baby. But almost that's what we have to do with, when people come along with a, with a bad idea. And, and, and I guess it's giving them the tools to understand that what they're doing hasn't hasn't got legs or they're going the wrong the wrong way. And um and actually changing track and 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 finding a better business than than the one they're pursuing. The IQ program is actually quite renowned for early career researchers, and and they're not just uh, necessarily early early career researchers. There's always um, a principal investigator involved as well uh, of going out and actually coming back with something that was unexpected, but a really good quality commercially interesting idea um, I put a team in from Birmingham and we went out with what we thought was um, was um, a safety device for use in the rail industry but when we talked to the rail industry worldwide we discovered that in fact it would take years to be adopted as a safety device because safety is such a conservative area for obvious reasons in the rail industry but the problem that they actually had was being able to schedule maintenance because the, the rail tracks deteriorate in a in a in a difficult to predict way and so they either find themselves doing maintenance on rail that doesn't need it or having to rush out and do emergency maintenance on 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 rails which have um, deteriorated quicker than expected but with a cheap device that reports on on the rail um rail condition uh they could save a lot of money for rail track it was a sum of around 10 million a year and that was substantive enough to to build some real interest and 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 the successful innovate uk bid um i need to catch up i'm not spoke to the guys for a, during pandemic but hopefully it's now actually out there as a technology but it it was completely unexpected where the market was for this device and it wasn't where we thought it was until we had those detailed and substantive conversations with the with the industry themselves right um shall i kick on again um how are we doing for time okay uh so just another quick example from um birmingham university uh spin out company called viatem um which was which was one of mine while i was working on while i was there um and really just to, to illustrate how you can start these these things off so um 
This was based on a on a publication in Nature by Professor Ed Ranger, who had discovered um, a short peptide called Pepitem that had a very important and, and previously unrecognised role in autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, we were able to put together a bid to um, to the university. Who, um, Birmingham University has some internal funds, proof of concept funds, and we managed to get a hundred thousand of proof of concept. We got fifty thousand proof of concept from Mercy Ventures, and we secured uh, a biomedical catalyst grant from Innovate UK. And we did make some progress. Um, but drug discovery is phenomenally difficult and takes a long time and is hugely expensive. So we burnt through that money quite quickly. Um, I, I spoke to the guys at the, in, in the business a while back and they are hoping to um, to raise some more money. Um, they've had one unsuccessful bid for further um, biomedical catalyst funding, but that's not unexpected. But they are, they've, they've got quite a few hours in the fire to take it forward. But the point here is, um, <clears throat> firstly, um, being a nature publication is no guarantee of success. It's still a lot of hard work to get further funding to take it forward. In this case, it did require um, a patent application. In fact, several patents were um, applied for, not just around the technology itself, but around potential uh, potential strategies for to create drugs to to interact with with Pepitem. Um, <clears throat> and, and also that, you know, some sectors which are quite specialist, like drug discovery, are really hard work. And just because you've got a really good idea in a nature publication, it doesn't mean that people are going to shower you with with resources to take it further. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, I just wanted to move on now to um, valorization or increasing the value of the idea of the technology. And um, the uh, and can increasing both the commercial value but also the impact that you can generate from, from getting the idea into the marketplace. <clears throat> and, I, and I think the things that add real value in, at this point is confirming the route to market, which is the first and most important thing. Um, developing a commercialization strategy, which might be a business plan, um, and particularly uh, and, and, and people don't often think of this, but what we're actually doing is um, de-risking the opportunity to attract grants and investments because all these ideas have huge potential upside. Going back to Viatem, if we were able to develop a, a therapeutic um, around, uh, around the, the, the Pepitem pathway, the market would be substantive, but the risk is also huge for any drug development. So many fail during um, clinical trials that to be able to secure further funding, all the work we were doing was about de-risking um, the technology so that the investor could see that there was a realistic chance of getting a return on their, their investment. And where does that de-risking focus? Well, the first is IP protection. I'll come back to talk about uh, about IP uh, in a little while. It's also about attracting the right talent or management talent to, to the opportunity. And investors, and I would include grant, grant bodies like Innovate UK, are greatly encouraged or reassured by seeing members of a team that have experience of doing this before. So going back to Viatem, we recruited a couple of ex AstraZeneca scientists and a chairman who had a substantive track record of successfully taking 
um, medical technologies through to the market. And, and I think you need to have some of the right talent on board. It's very difficult to convince investors that people doing this for the first time uh, are likely to be successful. So one of the early things to do is build the right team around the opportunity. Um, regulatory approval. Again, it's a significant barrier to being able to commercialise a technology and having a strategy and the resources to gain regulatory approval and again experience and knowledge of how to do that significantly de-risks uh, an opportunity and if you gain regulatory approval then that puts you a long way further down the line and and becomes a barrier between you and competitors um, uh, which in itself adds significant value to an opportunity being able to demonstrate the technology in the real world is important and gather data. And, and for those that aren't familiar, um, the concept of technology readiness level is frequently used in this area. And, and the technology readiness level is a is a, um, a scale from one to ten. It was originally developed by NASA, where one is it works in the laboratory and ten is it's on the market as a product. And the progress is sort of gradated gradated between those two two extremes around prototype that's working prototype that's working in in an environment where the product would be expected to to work etc um, and moving up that technology readiness level is is an important way of decreasing the risk and increasing the value of the opportunity you're working on and alongside the idea of lean start which is testing your your assumptions around a technology um, another approach the business model canvas is is being widely used and it's a way of thinking about your business model or business plan in uh, nine uh, boxes um, or nine areas which relate to areas of importance in terms of of the plan to get into the market. Um, it starts in the centre with value proposition and I've subdivided it into the three key areas. So the first area there in pink is what makes the product desirable to the customers and the mechanism of actually getting to the customer and making the sale. So all the so that would form the basis of a, of a marketing plan or strategy in a, in a business plan. On the left hand side is the feasibility. This is all the practical stuff. What is it you need to do? Who do you need to work with? Who do you need to employ? What assets do you need to control to be able to, to take this technology to the market? And then at the bottom in green is the viability. And that's very simple. Can you make this thing or deliver this service for less than it costs? Or can you make it for less than you can sell it for. So is it capable of delivering a margin? And is that margin sufficient to pay for the rest of the business? So that's quite a simple test because you know you can sell anything if it's cheap enough. But if you if you're selling it for less than you're making it for, it has to be a very sophisticated business model to, to be successful. Maybe if you're Amazon or Facebook and your strategy is world domination and then make profit, Fine, but for most businesses, you've got to be able to make a margin for the thing to be to be viable as a as a as a business. So, and I guess what comes out of your commercialisation strategy in universities generally seen as 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 two routes, either spin out or a license. Um, so a license is where you you sell the technology to a third party, usually a business, who will develop and exploit it and pay the university a royalty based on on product sales. A spin out is where the the technology is transferred into a company in which the university holds equity and then the um, and then when the 
company eventually gets the technology into the market um, and becomes a scalable business, then ultimately that company uh, will be bought either by um, another business or will float on the stock market and return the shareholders, including the university, um, a, a return. So it's two very distinct strategies. Um, and a lot of university derived technology goes down those routes. But I would actually suggest that and the reason I put a question mark is that the reality is a lot more complicated than than that. Um, also in here, um, most universities are having a poli have a policy of sharing the proceeds or the surplus from uh, spin outs or licenses. The, um, the commercialization or the transfer of that technology with the originating um, inventors, generally academics, and uh, I'll talk a bit about what kills policies on that. So, uh, and when I say it's it's a bit more complicated than that, I think there are numerous different business models that that universities can and do engage with that is a way of commercialising that technology and sometimes we're a bit blinkered and think it's either got to be a licence or we've got to go down the full-blooded spin-out company but essentially it's just ways that you sell a product uh, charge for a service or or license the technology so somebody else can sell your product or charge for a service or in fact you know there's opportunities for contract r d and one of the things that has happened in the last well, probably more than a decade, but certainly um, particularly in the pharmaceutical industry, but increasingly in other industries. And that is that the, the research and development is being contracted out to other organisations. So the rise of the, contra the CRO, the contract research organisation in the pharmaceutical industry has been particularly pronounced. And some of those CROs are now themselves quite large valuable companies employing many hundreds of people um, but a lot of the work they do is for other people in terms of of developing their their technologies to the marketplace so there's a lot more complexity in the business model that you can that you can envisage around around that technology not just a simple spin out or license so i'm going to talk you through an example that i worked on at Bir university of birmingham and that's called um, microbes ng coincidentally my initials but nothing to do with me in terms of the name um, so uh, microbes ng is a microbe microbial genome sequencing service that was developed within the university it was based on a large bbsrc grant that established the the, the service um, and it was a collaboration between the medical school at birmingham and the and uh, school of life sciences um, Microbes NG itself was led by a team of academics, but probably the most active was um, Professor Nick Lonan, who has a background in, in sequencing, uh, microbial sequencing, had worked on Ebola, and um, uh, is, is, of course, fairly busy at the moment with the, with the current, current pandemic. Um, and usually for a university based service, they were very business like in their approach to setting up the service. They streamlined it so that uh, they were able to offer a relatively inexpensive service. So coming back to what was their leverage, their leverage was um, a very efficient and streamlined service that they were able to offer a significant um, significant reduction to what other people in the market were, were offering. So um, that carved them a position in the marketplace through just being easy to use and they were turning over a significant amount of money. When the grant came to was coming to an end, they um, fortunately and with some foresight got in touch with um, Birmingham Innovations, the, the Birmingham um, the bit of the university, sorry, Birmingham Enterprise, the bit of the university charged with 
commercialising and managing IP and uh, commercial opportunities. And we looked very carefully what, the, the, what we were doing. We confirmed that it was viable as a business. We looked at the intellectual property, which in this case wasn't based around patents, but was based on um, a, 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 a something called goodwill in business, but essentially having lots of customers, active customers, um, and a, and a, you know an, an interaction with them and a database of customers. So they were well known in the marketplace. They had significant know-how. They had some expensive bit of quick, bits of kit which doesn't which helped, and they had they had developed a database of sequences, which was an important part of of what they were able to offer to customers above and beyond um, some of the other services in the marketplace. So they had a really nice offering. So we spun it out of the university, um, but that wasn't simple. Um, the the way we actually did it, uh, and I'm not giving away any secrets here because it is all on Companies House. It's a matter of public record um, that the uh, founding academic, together with a um, with a successful entrepreneur as a partner, who just happened to be his brother, but um, but nevertheless um, came having recently exited from another business so um with some some cash to invest in the process and they set up a new company and acquired the service from the university so it was a spin out but we had to do it like that for all sorts of reasons some of them related to tax some of them related to ip and some of them related to practicalities um but it it, it got the service out of the university um it's um in the university science park so that was another another benefit to the university and still had very close links with the department and and the research that was going on in the university um so the university didn't lose all of that expertise know-how um completely so it was a it was a good win for everybody but it was quite a complicated thing to put together in the way that we didn't and certainly didn't tick either of those boxes of being a license or a, or, or, or a classic spin out. So I think it's important to recognise that, you know, many businesses tend up being not straightforward and, and, and slightly more complex in the way that they, they actually come to, to fruition. Right, I promised I'd talk a little bit about intellectual property and um, I, I think I, I just wanted to say that um, intellectual property is an asset that can take a number of forms. So in this simplest, it can be know-how or a secret, a uh, trade secret. It can be copyright, which is an automatic right. You don't have to put copyright and a little C mark on materials for them to be copyright, but it's helpful to the reader or the user of your your written materials to understand that you are you are asserting that that right of copyright but it is an automatic right um, and protects written materials music um, works of literature um, all sorts of things that, that that you know that are that are written down um, but then some rights you have to apply for so they are registered rights and that could be a registered design it could be a trademark which is very valuable in, in in commercial terms to protect the terminology and the goodwill which i mentioned earlier that you build up around a business you can protect with, with a trademark but probably the 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 sort of rolls royce and the ones uh, one that's particularly associated with university technology transfer is the patent um, and the patent is a, a right for a limited period um, of 20 years generally um, in return for full disclosure or full publication you have the right to exclusively exploit or use um, an invention or, or an idea it is a commercial tool and it's a very useful tool as part of a commercial strategy where that strategy requires significant investment into the development of the idea into a business 
so that the investors who fund that development have the opportunity to recover their investment and to make a make a return, which is the reason they make the investment in the first place. It's not a publication. It's not um, something that you should just have uh, as a as a as a badge of honor or as a you know because patents are expensive. Um, it's not really to stop other people nicking your idea. It is purely to protect the idea long enough um, that you can make a return on it. And it isn't about restricting um, knowledge because it is a requirement of patents that when the patents is granted, you you fully disclose what it is that you've that you've discovered. Um, and to get a patent, your idea or your invention or your technology must be novel, which means it must be new. And at the point that you apply for a patent, which gives you a priority date, it must be secret. So you mustn't have disclosed it to anybody outside of your immediate organisation. Um, it needs to have some other characteristics. It needs to be inventive. So you can't patent something that's obvious. But that test of obviousness is something that a patent agent would need to do because um, what might be obvious to you or me is not necessarily obvious in the eyes of, of the law. And why, what might be non-obvious actually is obvious to somebody um, skilled in the art. So, um, so it's a it's a complicated legal test rather than 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 necessarily as the as the English uh, would imply. But it's nevertheless an important fact that a patent can only be granted on an inventive step. So you can't patent things that are of nature. Uh, and different countries have slightly different rules and interpretations of of what constitutes an inventive step. It need, needs to be capable of use, so it needs to be an, an apparatus, a product or a manufacturing process. So as part of the patenting process, you have to demonstrate how it would be used or how it would be made. Um, and it has to be allowable because there are some categories of things which are excluded and you can't patent. So just reiterating, it has to be a useful tool as part of a commercial strategy because it enables the investment into the development of an idea. But patterns are expensive. They can be really expensive. Um, to make that priority application would probably cost between two to seven thousand pounds, depending on how how um, complicated it is. Yes, in theory, you can write your own patent application and the registration fees are only a couple of hundred pounds. But, you know, in, in the real world, um, a patent written by an amateur is like a scientific paper written by somebody who's experimenting in his shed at the bottom of the garden. It might have merit, but the chances are it doesn't. So um, as a university, we would generally, you know, use use um, actual patent agents to, to to put that that idea in um, but it's expensive and we don't actually have a patent budget so to be able to get um, uh, the money for a patent does require a certain amount of persuasion um, of the uh, director of DRI that what we have not only will benefit the university will deliver impact not necessarily commercial return, um, and that there is a foreseeable way um, of taking that technology into the marketplace where a third party will pick up the future costs of, of that patent. Because whilst we're talking a few thousand to get the priority date, the next stage when you take the patent to an international starts being a few tens of thousands of pounds and the renewal fees beyond that. So patenting, it's not for the faint hearted, it can be very expensive, but it is very useful. And to access some of that Innovate UK money, they would expect to, to see a patent to protect that technology because when the grant money runs out, there would need to be investors that come in and support the technology through to the, the marketplace. 
except in the unusual case where you might be able to make it all the way to the market on 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 grants alone um so that's all i'm going to say about patenting um at, the, at, at this time but again refer you to university policy and and this university the policy is that whilst we can be persuaded to make an initial patent application we would expect that within that first year we find a partner who will pick up the continued funding of that that patent in all but the most exceptional of cases so technology in the marketplace i mentioned that you know we need to to fund the development to to the marketplace so beyond grants what sort of money might be available well the typical um place that invest inventors go for funding um and whether it's a company or a license would be to start with own capital personal wealth uh, reinvest in company profits soft funding like grants um i've put the th three the three f's which stands for friends families and fools um who are the people that can be persuaded to put money into risky early stage ventures you then might look at debt finance um you don't bother going to your high street bank because they don't invest in this sort of stuff but there are people who will fund what's called debt finance which is a loan and increasingly a, a, a financial instrument that's used is something called a convertible loan so an investor might put money into your business as a loan but with the option to convert to equity if it looks like what you're doing is going to be successful and then of course there's the the equity finance the classic venture capital business angels high net worth individuals who will back interesting and risky ideas and a new the new kid on the block although it's been around probably um, about 10 years is crowdfunding and crowdfunding is interesting because going right back to the start of the process crowdfunding can be a way of actually testing an idea and testing people's appetite for, for an idea using the, the wisdom of crowds i guess they're not always right and and the people who receive crowdfunding are not not always well executed but it is an interesting alternative way of financing um technological development and and and, and finally um the whole point of this for the investors is to exit so um at some point um if you are developing a a business it has to return something if it's a company you need to be able to exit generally be by by selling that business to somebody bigger a lot of the companies that i've developed over the years have been sold you know have been sold to a bigger fish unfortunately the way that 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 business works in the uk those are often overseas fish um with with bigger pockets and bigger markets than 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 we have um and building that business to a point at which it might be acquired will take five ten even 15 years some of the companies i set up at sheffield have only just exited um you know some 15 years later and i did promise i'd i would um tell you what's in it for for the inventor according to Kiel's policy so the university where it has exploited IP and that IP has generated a return which sometimes it does then the net surplus will be distributed to the inventors and to the inventors faculty um, but that is after all costs have been uh, retained by the university so the cost of patenting the cost of um, any uh, uh, cost of patenting some of the staff time costs that have gone into developing that technology would be would be taken out but that if that leaves a net surplus then that is shared with the inventor and the inventors faculty uh, and we've got a, a bit of a sliding scale at Keel so the first ten thousand pounds the inventor gets to keep eighty percent of it ten thousand to fifty thousand it's a fifty fifty split fifty thousand to a million it's 40% to the investor and 60% to the inventors and beyond a million it's subject to further negotiation um, some of those figures might seem to be huge but you know what 
some university spin outs achieve those sorts of valuations. I've certainly seen some of the companies I've set up have sold for seven figure sums and, you know, would be returning at the bottom end of that scale to the academics that I that I worked with. Not me, he says bitterly, um, but uh, um, and the Bristol spin out, which was part of the IQ programme. It was in cohort for the IQ programme um, was sold with a valuation of, I think, 680 million. Um, it was um, a, a potential therapeutic for diabetes and was substantively shaped by um, the IQ process and the knowledge that came back from their conversations with the marketplace. So um, very if anybody's interested in the IQ program, we got a team, um, um, one of uh, Nick Forsyth's early career researchers um, put a team together and we got through, um, got onto the IQ program uh, this time last year, which was which was a great experience for, for, for everybody. Um, <coughs> I had quite a bit of success at Birmingham. Um, I got seven teams in the process and as we've only had one team at Kiel, um, the, uh, the the Midlands IQ team have been using me as a as um as an assessor for the applications to the programme. So um, hopefully, if we want to put an application key, key application in, I should be able to give you a good steer on what makes a, a successful application. Um, although I will have to declare <laughs> a conflict of interest when it comes to the assessment. Um, it's a great programme. It's a little bit prescriptive in 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 the teams you can put up for it you have to have a, a PI early career researcher who's prepared prepared to take a three months secondment to um, to do the customer discovery unfortunately since pandemic that customer discovery has to be virtual the uh, the days of spending three months traveling the world uh, are, are unfortunately no more but we live in hope that that we could be back there and um, it needs somebody from the university uh, a technology transfer lead um, but we should be able to find somebody to to, to do that without too much too much difficulty um, you usually have an external advisor as well so that's the four member team um, but the IQ program will actually appoint an external advisor um, if you don't have one already um, and they have funding to pay that external advisor. So sometimes it's a good good idea to let them make that appointment. And that is the end of my slides. And hopefully we've got a little bit of time to um, answer some questions. Um, I will just stop sharing my slides. And fortunately, I haven't overrun, so I haven't uh, uh, slipped over people's opportunity to to enjoy the football. Uh, I'll just stop people. sharing my screen. Now. Questions, comments? You have a good margin for the football. I'm from Switzerland, so we won last night. Just oh, oh, what a game! And couldn't have, it could not have been more exciting. <laughs> It was, it was not easy to follow uh, as a supporter. But anyway, uh, going back to the topic before we diverge, uh, I, I was quite interested in the, the your mention of crowdfunding. And uh, actually, my it's not a mine, my invention. My son invented the card game over lockdown. So we're, we're going on a Kickstarter campaign. Uh, oh, fantastic. On 17th July. So uh, uh, yeah, so uh, we will experience, see what happens with this card game. I, I quite like what you said about, yeah, well, usually when you in initially get some feedback, if you get it from people who know you, then they are, they'll be uh, reluctant to uh, say negative things about the product, right? Yeah. And I thought, I mean, in our case, we didn't necessarily try, I mean, it was impossible with lockdown to ask uh, people we didn't know. I mean, we basically couldn't really test the game outside our house. So, mm -hmm. But I think it's probably a, yeah, a good uh, thing to remember to ask critical opinion from even people we know. Some people are able to give critical uh, feedback, even if they know us. Mm. There's, um, 
actually coming back to the IQ program at, at the start of the process, they said, you know, they, they, they start by saying, look, there's no point asking your mum whether it's a good idea. You know, you need to ask people who, who will be critical of it. Um, I would say the acid test for a product is real customers parting with real cash. And actually, Kickstarter is a great place to find whether real people will part with real cash for your idea, which is coming back to why crowdfunding has elements of, of lean start about it. Um, but I think the other thing, and, 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 and you know, the iCure program starts with a with a boot camp to train early career researchers to to go out into the world and talk to potential customers and that training is actually quite critical and the, and the first thing that we have to do with with people who come from an academic background and and, and I'm probably as prone to this as anybody is actually just to get people to to shut up and listen um but that's quite hard for an academic because you know um because we aspire to well i don't because i'm not academic but academics i guess when, you know when i when i thought i might follow that track the aspiration was to be a professor and, and professor this the, the word comes it means to teach so, or to profess to tell people stuff so i i i think you know we all love to talk about and tell people about our, our technology and to actually go to go out to a potential customer and just ask questions and not tell them about our research is actually quite difficult to do. Um, but in terms of, of getting that really useful information about an, a, a, about your potential customers, um, it, it's it, you you have to you, you have to have those conversations, and and the results can be quite quite surprising. There there was one. It was actually a BioCity program where they were they went out and they were they were looking at potential business around um, high throughput screening, and they actually found that there was a difference as to whether they were talking to people who came from a biological background or a chemical background, in terms of their their um, attitude to high throughput screening, which which was really quite quite unexpected. But but I suppose it made some sense that biologists tended to be more um more wedded to their to their compounds than chemists so for a chemist chuck them through the system throw them away you know we don't care what it is whereas a biologist oh, i want to test my compound and if my compound doesn't work i will probably test it again because i don't want to lose it so so uh, 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 and that they came from talking going out and talking to lots of lots of scientists and and influenced how they then sold and marketed the service that they were they were setting up okay, on another point i don't know i don't see other questions so maybe i can discuss uh, i mean I'm, I'm i'm part of the school of chemical and physical sciences and i think for example for chemists in our school there is probably a lot of potential there is always some potential for anyone but i'm thinking especially in terms of chemists and i was wondering how I can support and kind of maybe almost go the other way around. I think what you, you described, uh, finding a good problem and whether uh, we can work with you to actually tease out the problems that companies have so that we can invest uh, some of our time. I think what you described also as contract research organization or something like this, whether there's a way to actually uh, build that and develop that and how efficient it is, because you also mentioned danger of if you just do contract research while you're working for somebody else's goal and you it might distract us from our long term goal. But I thought there would be some potential in yeah. in chemical sciences for for us to. I mean, maybe ask businesses, do you, do you, have, do you have some work you want us to do? Yeah. Uh, the, I think there's enormous potential. There's enormous potential, and I think that uh, doing it in this sort of structured, supported way through some of the programs that we discussed early on today, through CRISP and so forth, it is a way of doing that where you have support to mediate those relationships, mm -hmm. to form those relationships, to get people used to it. You can also buddy up with people who have maybe been in this particular area for a little bit longer in terms of having those difficult decisions with customers and clients. Uh, 
being able to give them the hard word, but give them some a position where they can pivot to and so forth. And that's the sort of support I think that at the end of today we're we're basically offering. Yeah. Mm. I, mean, I work in the um, central sciences laboratories um, as a technician and we've basically got a very big building um, with a lot of facilities and a lot of equipment and the equipment I tend to say is well we invest in it almost like farmers invest in a combine harvester you know we use it for three weeks a year and the rest of the time it's sat idle so an awful lot of there's an awful lot of capability to actually say other people, you know, if if we could enable other people to use that facility, I would imagine there's an awful lot of scope there. Um, and at the moment, we're in a summer shutdown kind of status where, you know, the building pretty much not used for 10 weeks. So, you know, that's an enormous chunk of time that a lot of organisations could do a lot of work with. Mm. And there's opportunities not just to exploit your actual, you know, your capital uh, outlay materials, but also to build those sorts of things into curricula. So you get actually students doing that work, doing that sort of contract research work for real clients in real projects. And that's the sort of situation where you're building, where everybody wins. Students get that really good experience, that machine gets used, there's money coming into the university, we're building that network, the client gets the work done, and so on and so forth. It just requires a little bit of thinking about where it is you want to position yourself on that business support through to invention spectrum. Yeah. yeah. Whereabouts you want to actually position yourself in terms of innovation and so on, and then how you exploit it, be mm -hmm. curricular or extracurricular. And, and, and some of it is actually getting some of the practicalities right. Um, so speed of response, <clears throat> the ease of setting up um, an account to do the business, the ease of being able to undertake the 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 work on the relevant bit of equipment and having the right equipment with the right setup that that companies might want to use um i've actually um asked um what one of phil's colleagues andra andra Muntin. i don't know if you've 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 met andra yet but she's from a chemistry background and and one of her sort of side projects alongside chris is is to actually look at um uh, is to look at the equipment we have available across the university and to see where there might be an opportunity to work with businesses and that might be through a formal program like CRISP where we can use the resource of CRISP to overcome some of the problems of of tailoring the equipment to the problem or to the company um, but it might be that that informally we can we can promote that equipment to science park companies and, and that might be a quick win because we already have contractual relationships with those companies. Yeah. We could maybe look at a way of invoicing them through um, through the our existing accounting system. I'm sure it's not going to be as easy as it sounds, but it's something we used to do at BioCity um, because we we had contractual relationships with both the university and the tenants. We we had a situation where the tenants could use university equipment, and we would bill them. You know, rather than having to set up a new account with the university every time, which 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 is is frequently long winded and 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 gets in the way of that sort of responsive innovation that that companies need. But I I I I think there's enormous opportunities, and if we spot the right sectors, you know, um, anything to do with with pharmaceuticals and medicines is is mostly about chemistry, not bio. Uh, I was fascinated with BioCity, mostly chemists, not biologists. And the most yeah. valuable bit of kit, I managed to find a grant that bought an NMR. And, and that piece of kit got got used all the time. It was doing at least two, three hundred samples every single day um, for the for the companies there. Um, but, you, you know, um, there's lots of stuff around sustainability, materials, um, testing of 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 all sorts of materials that we get in, inquiries about which i'm sure we could and should be doing at the university and that might be the start of a relationship that builds into a ktp innovate uk bid or something like that so long as we see it in that light and i and I, we're never going to be in the business of providing high throughput 
analytical testing um, because there's plenty of people out there that do it and they and they're set up to do it and they do it fast and cheap unless you know microbes ng they did set themselves up to do high throughput analytical um well in that case genome testing um but that was very much a one-off um you know i think we're looking for people that have got problems that need equipment and expertise to solve and i think that's probably a really good place because i think we've all got meetings to go to oh, okay. <laughs> i should say thank you very much to, to nick and to phil and thanks everybody else for your participation remember we're in the si8 world when we are in the si8 we're in the si8 and we're open for business you want to come yeah. and have a chat with us come along come and have a natter come and have a coffee let's have a chat about it i'm, I'm sure we can help yeah I want, is, you have you one minute. I just i just want to mention i've uh, set up a discussion time with uh, i think a tenant at um, the innovations hub developing a solar uh, solar solar wind turbine for homes i know they're very comfortable and I'm working with them as well. So let's get together and have a brew about it. So I'm talking to them on Friday and I I, I also learned very useful information not to be the expert when I talk to them, but it will be a strong temptation that uh, they need to do the, the maths. So I, I've, I've done the initial maths and it doesn't look so positive from my initial maths calculation. So I, I just, so maybe we'll be in touch. Right. Yeah, I, I suspect they may need a few pivots, but yeah. I've, I've been in, impressed by their enthusiasm and energy, and that will <laughs> take them a long way. But they, they need not to be afraid to pivot because, you know, I've seen that idea many times before. And, and, and it comes down to the, the physics and the, and the economics. I also, yeah, I like your idea of presenting it as a pivot. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like... So I'm available to discuss with that company because I teach uh, renewable energy in the second year from physics and we have the uh, basic uh, maths and physics behind it. Okay. Oh, brilliant. Okay. Good. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks for your okay. time. I'll speak to you soon. Yeah. Bye now. Cheers.